I won't let this all be for nothing. I will pay your price. You're searching for death. I've been searching for life. If life is your curse, then perhaps living is the cure. I love mechanics and I love systems. And it's so important to see the ways in which system helps you tell story. Because there's always that moment at the beginning of like giving a big GM explanation of something. And you're like, okay, so here's the deal. Here's the room. What do you want to do? The first thing everyone does is look down at their sheet to begin to figure out based on their mechanics, based on their playbook, based on their rules, what they can do in the world. So it's important to have mechanics that lean in and help you figure out what you want. And this idea that because you're a circle, you take the things that you do well, you take moments that are like gilded, that you're especially focused on, and you build this pool and you increase your odds for success in a world where all of the like big crazy things you do are attrition. Like so many of the things that you can do that like can change the face of an encounter or a moment require giving up something to brain or bleed or body. This is a game that wears you down over time because magic is not free and easy and good. It is painful and scary and a little bad and you're reaching towards something that like you as an organization, like your whole reason for being here is to control that. But this is why Candela shines in the dark for so many centuries. If not for us, what will keep the dark at bay? Hope is the economy that a GM plays with the most, and that's the thing you take away. Hope is the last thing that dies before you do. So it's a perfect system to like lean into that feeling. You want them to be bought in on the things that are happening to their characters, especially as things get bad. As circles do, as circles must. I think the hardest part about wrangling the players, I think it's about what actually happens to people when they're stressed. If you're doing your job right, uh, if you're telling the spooky story really well, your table should start to feel a little uh, anxious and tense. And the truth of that is physiologically, like you're getting tunnel vision, you're, you're beginning to panic. And as you're sort of acknowledging that like, yes, my pretend person in my head is going through something right now, but if I'm in it, I might be experiencing that too. You have to like sit there and remind them like, I know you're going through it right now. I know you're looking for something on your sheet that maybe if you uh, pitch something crazy, like you could do something that could change the world. And I'm here to remind you gently that my job here is to be the stakes of a grounded world. And know that if I'm about to like give you a bunch of marks or a scar or, you know, the worst thing, uh, if your character is about to uh, pass on, know that it's simply because this is how the story goes. And let's just lock in and know that like we're doing the thing that we set out to do, even if it feels a little crazy and tense in the moment. All roads lead in this direction. And you know that the important thing here is, again, going back into like how the like setting and how the mechanics tell you how you wanna play. Before you start your play, you build your circle. You build how you connect to these people. The like relationships are a part of the character gen you do. So you know out the gate as you start play, who we are to each other is paramount. And uh, as a like GM personally, I love character. I think the moment you get like the group bought in on who we are and who we are to each other and who we are to the world, a lot of other things fall in place and all of the story and all of the plot feels more personal and you can get to bigger and more interesting and more dramatic emotions once you're like, I don't, it's not just that I care about myself and the thing I built or the thing I walked into our like session zero with, my funky little idea, but it's, oh no, here's how I'm so inexorably tied to every other person here that now everything I have and everything I've made, I want it to serve the thing that I care about in my arc. But like, how do I support and maintain those relationships or change them if they're like negative or not indicative of like where I want my character to end? You're all monsters, but all the best stories are about monsters. You gotta spend that first bit making them care about each other, and then you hit them with, like, the world. 
look at us all. All like little candles in the dark. I've enjoyed my little bit of light. Perhaps it's time to put the wick out. Look me in the eye and explain to me how you walk into a horror game and go, I'm gonna play the oldest man. My bones are made of talcum powder and let's see if I die. You're like, Tide and bone, keepers of the light. Cosmo's sweet little old man voice is the only thing that kept me from murking him in like minute one. I gotta be so honest about that. But like, what a character to build. Like when you're talking about building your own tragedy, uh, Liam did that with a deftness and like a heart that, uh, I'm never surprised because that would imply that I didn't know he was capable of it. But just coming out the gate with, here's my guy, but this like repository of knowledge about things both esoteric and just historical in this world. He's my he's my, my assistant, like lore, lore monkey and my little plot hound, but also built a thing that he's like, and I know I'm very vulnerable and uh, that's gonna be part of it. And then when you start to understand his like backstory and what he actually was, was this person that's connected to Sam's character, Oscar. You believe at the beginning that he's his great, 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 great grandfather. And then you find out that this is Oscar's son. You, you. Uh, good father. Was I? Oh yes. You didn't invite this upon yourself. You did the best you could with what you had. By virtue of you being a billion years old and having the connections that you all built together, you're the hub of this, you're the spark of this, you're a Candela member that should have been a light keeper three de like four decades ago. So why are you still here? Let's treat you as the jumping off point. Like your question is the thing that's going to bring these people together because across your decades of getting to know them and bringing them into the fold, bringing them into Candela, he's like the top level recruiter. This dude's like a Girl Scout that sells a thousand Thin Mints a month. Uh, you have brought them all in because there might be some clue in one of their uh, weird X-Men powers that will help you understand and solve the mystery of your father. So well, we've always done what was needed. Not always comfortable, but definitely necessity. You always want to have that tension right away. So the cool thing about the character that Sam built uh, in Oscar, Sam coming in with this character in mind uh, was maybe the scariest thing I had to deal with, if I'm being very honest. That was like that question of, I'm thinking of maybe playing a character that can't die. And I went, ha 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 my stakes. <laughs> that's so interesting. Death is the thing that's on the table in this game in a way that like, it's part of the horror of it. So how do I live in a world where I tell a story about the horror of attrition and the things you like give up over time in order to pursue a goal with a character that cannot die? And the interconnectedness between uh, Sam's character and Liam's character was so beautiful and so touching. And I loved the secret of it up top of having Carrie I'll just call him Carrie sometimes, having uh, having him look like he was in his like late 30s and yet being older than the world's oldest man, our 97 year old, uh, was such a good secret that again, it was the like, okay, the getting to the yes of that had everything to do with me sitting down and figuring out like, what's the horror to a person that can't die? But every joy that I've ever had is taken from me. Every love that I've ever had, every family I've ever known, they just, I outlast them. And Sam's just an incredible player. So getting to that yes and giving him what he wanted and then playing through a character that had to reveal a big secret and then learn in real time across our uh, chapter how to be a good father and how to show up and be there for people was just such a heartwarming moment. Saying goodbye is a, a big part of life. And it's not one that I've, not something I've been able to do ever. Um, so I guess I'll just, I just want to say thank you instead. Ashley Birch is so cool and so game to like 
go big and go wide. I love that she came in out the gate and was like, I want to do Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing. Like, this is a person that like experimented on herself in order to like get rid of a disease. And then we and eventually, as we were talking, uh, built towards the disease being something that was sort of class coded because she was like, I want to play a high status character that's fallen out of favor. I'm like, great, I'm gonna give you the class problem of this disease that only a certain kind of people get. So now you are doubly incentivized to cure it and also never tell anyone you have it. So you'll become more desperate and work on yourself. Like, let's figure out all the reasons within the world that you would get to this point of desperation. But it was really fun to sit down with her and have a conversation about like, great, I wanna give you this beast. I wanna give you this thing that's gonna go out of control and rampage. Let's talk about why it should be mechanical and not narrative. So there is this sense of, not again. You don't get to do this to me again. Not without me being here too. So you can come out, but you're going to play. Nice. And it's it's truly a masterwork to watch how well she did it while still being like emotionally available to the other players and still solving the problem and still like making connections and caring about what she cared about and caring about what everyone else cared about. The lift on that was not light and she made it look effortless. Are you worried about me, Elsie? I'm a doctor, it's my job. I think my favorite moment uh, of Elsie throughout all of this was when she called out a moment to go speak with Lightkeeper Nakari and really called out what was going to, it was already in my uh, like notes and in the, uh, the run up to what was going to be the cold open for the finale where she, she understood the assignment and was like, well, what's Candela gonna do uh, when we, if, if, if and when we do become a problem? And I was just like, ooh. So our fate is at your discretion. Your fate is at your discretion. It will just be harder to smudge once Cosmo is no longer in the field. It felt so great because of like, now it's not gonna come out of nowhere. Now the audience knows, like she knows, like the table knows that this is on, like this is a part of the buffet that I could pick from and I'm absolutely gonna come in with it. And it was just so cool. What kind of ending are you looking for? We're not concerned with the ending, more the journey. Oh, this year. Raj came in with a very strong, like, here's who I am. Here's all the things that I was raised inside of. And now here I am as an adult, deeply traumatized, but absolutely a badass. And very much big, he's got big lone wolf energy. So it's like, uh, even in the discussion of, I was like, yeah, you all have worked with Candela. And he's like, I was a consultant. I'm like, oh, okay. You've gone out of your way to be like, no, not really, calm down. I don't wear the little pin. Uh, and it just holds himself apart and away, even from like, I'll never truly release people, but I can't be close to them. I have intimacy issues. I don't have to like you, to trust you. And I promise you here and now, I will give my everything to keep you safe. I love when a player is like, again, you can't hurt me more than I can hurt me. And every time he would like, we would like have a conversation and he would pitch something a little worse. And I was like, I'm not gonna say no. Oh, you want your body to be a hive? Yeah, yeah, dude, you can have bugs. Yeah, your bugs are bad. Uh, he just built this like beautiful character that like leaned into the monstrosity of self uh, in a way that like, I was like, oh, you're, you're selling my theme with truly every choice you make and everything you say. You're scary. A hive built into my body. <gasps> what the fuck? And I tell my children to feed. <gasps> children? What the, what the fuck? Madame Cordelia Glass. You have to have the X-Man that's got a normal power. <laughs> and uh, bless Gina for being the one that like had to constantly be like, you do what? And she just played it so well and it was so fun. And then uh, I loved in episode two that we really got like more of her deal and how she had been like, I love everything in her like storyline about being a transplant to this place, coming from a set of islands across the sea, uh, a village that like worshiped sea gods and having all of that taken away from her just before hitting the shores. 
the gods of the seer are fair. Who am I to question a god? So all of that, like all of the beautiful things in her life, including her family, were gone the moment she stepped on New Fair soil. And there's something about, again, the like stakes and tone of this world that like her entry point into it nails. This world as a whole is bad, but this place feels like the heart of a lot of it. Time is a funny thing. Always wanting more, never enough. Or is it too much? I am thrilled and delighted to be your storyteller for chapter three of Candela Obscura as we engage in the mystery and adventure and story and horror of the circle of Tide and Bone. <laughs>